do. Hi, everybody. This is Lisa Kessler from Kessler Insurance I'm here today on behalf of Cheers for Charity New Hampshire. And as always, I have the privilege of being here with my dear friend, Joanne Burchuk. Hey, Joanne. Chuck, I'm with Lighthouse Physical Therapy and, of course, Cheers for Charity. And uh, today we have a really great guest, uh, John Burns, and he's with SOS Recovery Community Organization. Uh, really great uh, organization out there helping mental health. So, John, please um, welcome and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about SOS. Sure. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is John Burns. I am a person in long-term recovery um and for and i'm also a family member i have a daughter who is in recovery um that has struggled with um has had previous struggles with addiction and i work with sos recovery community organization what we are we are a peer-based um recovery community organization that focuses on people who are either looking to find or maintain recovery from substance use disorder or problematic drug and alcohol use um, and we do that in an assortment of ways. It's, it's really about providing hope to individuals in the community. And so we have centers in Rochester as well as Dover and Hampton. Um, and in those centers, we provide one-on-one -on -one comprehensive recovery supports, which could be helping people build um, their own SMART goals around recovery. Um, a lot of it is really more about breaking down barriers that people have um commonly within their recovery so you know basic needs things of that nature whether it's housing or employment it's really not all specifically focused on recovery and then we also get a fair amount of people in crisis coming in who are looking to find recovery so helping them to navigate through a very complex system um, getting them connected with the doorway system here in new hampshire to get treatment if they so desire or sometimes it's just into getting people connected with harm reduction services um, because you know our goal is to keep people alive and that's one of the primary functions um, you know with the number of overdose deaths that we've had over the years um, with with the addiction epidemic I think it's you know our focus is really like how can we reduce a preventable death in our community and how do we help people get well and and find that wellness piece um, and but do it in a way that regardless of their pathway and regardless of how they do that. So it's really about self-directed and, and a lot of that's just built around community. So we also have a lot of meetings. We do art and recovery. We have yoga that we offer within our centers. Um, we do a CrossFit program with Ever Proven CrossFit here in Dover, New Hampshire, where people can can become part of a CrossFit program for their wellness just at no charge. Um, and all of our services were nonprofit, so all of our services are no charge to all the participants. Um, and then also a key piece of it too is breaking is reducing stigma. So we know there's a lot of stigma um, and and it's really about reducing stigma. A lot of the people come through our doors, it's not for problematic drug use, it's often for alcohol, and that often doesn't get much focus within our community. Um, so and, and then the other piece too is really family members. So we know that there's individuals out there, but it can really put a family into crisis. So how can we support family members, um, whether whether it's a parent or a spouse or a friend or a loved one, um, providing some of those mutual aid support groups and one-on-one -on -one supports for those individuals, um, as well as some parenting programs that we, that we do in conjunction with recovery. Um, and we have a very large program that's built around individuals who are involved with the criminal justice system and how we can support them through that, get them connected to employment and housing and things of that nature that will help them um, get out of that involvement and, and you know, be able to move forward having a healthy and productive life. Oh, that's fantastic. How do people, do, how do people generally find you? Is it um, you know, through other services, they're, they're generally referred to you? Yeah, um, I, a lot of people, it's just walk, they walk into the centers. Um, we do provide like, so we have a website, which is SOS, www.sosrco.org. Um, and on that, it has like an about us section where it shows, where it identifies all of our programs. And we have like secure documents in there where people can connect with our centers 
right through the through the referral and they can either refer themselves um you know we have people within the criminal justice system that refer us we've had we have people in social services that refer individuals here so it's really they're coming from a lot of different ways and we just in the last year and a half we started a rural program that is statewide so we're not just in this region but it's for tele recovery um, because of covid we you know and this was actually came about before covid but that's really amped it up where tele recovery for people who may not have transportation to get to a recovery center and we have a platform where we can connect with people and do all these services digitally and all they need is a smartphone so they could do it on a tablet or computer but they could do it with just a smartphone and it's all protected and we can video chat we can almost like a facebook messenger chat but a secure one um, or they can or they can just call us and we can do that through their smartphones and provide those services regardless of where they are in the state and that's really focused on rural areas for people who are criminally justice involved so we we're, we're in four different drug courts around the state where we attend every week um, but they really come to us from a lot of different areas as well as uh we have a 24 7 dispatch program with wentworth douglas hospital in dover where we go to the hospital for individuals that the doctors or nurses may identify with a substance use disorder and we have a contract with the hospital 24 7 we have a one hour response time where we go to the hospital and meet with people both in the emergency room as well as inpatient and we even have a program where we can go into the birthing center for moms um, who may have just given birth and may have struggled with substance use disorder. <laughs> you guys are all over the place. We are, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, oh gosh, I had like 10 questions come up when you were talking. Like this is just, uh, this is exciting for the people that, you know, provide so many resources out there for, um, you know, people in need. And that is, that's fantastic. I love what you guys are up to and doing right now um what do, did you find a huge uptick in the number of people requiring your services during this whole covid um epidemic? you know it's it's been really interesting because our model has always been in person and then one day i woke up and we're like we can't do the in person um so what are we going to do now because our whole like the foundation of what we do is connection um, and so we transformed into digital all recovery meetings eight times a day with an organization out of Philadelphia and, and another one in, in Portland, Oregon, and they're both recovery community organizations. So we have in the, in the year and within the year of when we started that, which was in March of 2020, we had over 500,000 people attend those meetings from 32 countries, which we never saw coming in a million years. We do it on Zoom and most of those meetings have 50 to 250 people in them. And we still run those right now, eight times a day, plus a family support meeting. Um, and that's really been a great collaboration. But so to answer your question, what we found with that is, so there's like two sides to this. There's the side where there's a lot of people we're not seeing that are still a little bit hesitant to come out and that's really a huge concern for us because we don't know how their recovery is doing, but we know that isolation and stigma are the biggest enemies of people who struggle. So we are, you know, what I anticipate seeing is a big increase in problematic alcohol use and substances. And we're going to see kind of the floodgates open, unfortunately. But the other, the positive side, the silver lining we've seen is a lot of people have identified in those digital supports that they would have they had too much social anxiety or too many barriers to come into a recovery center and we would have never connected with them without it so yeah none of that digital stuff is going to be able to go away because we have identified there's so many people that were just like yeah i would have never come and they sat in zoom meetings oftentimes with cameras off and didn't identify who they were for you know some of them would finally flip on their camera and start to share and they're like i've been coming for two months and this saved my life because i've been logging on every single day but i would have never gone into a recovery center so that's been like the really cool like okay we connected with a lot of people we would have never connected with otherwise um and a lot of that is driven by shame and barriers but you know hopefully we've reduced some of those moving forward You asked my question, Joanne. My question was about the COVID experience, just because you know you hear things in the news, right? Like there's less, there's more, there's this, there's that, right? Like, and you never know. It's all a matter of how they're breaking it down for the news. But 
I'm curious to see right. what you're saying. And the other thing that I think is is interesting too is you know there's still that sort of stigma or still that belief that that people who are impacted by this are somehow different or not in my backyard or it doesn't happen in my community and it totally happens in each one of our communities on the seacoast. Can you talk a little bit about how how the whole thing you know really truly impacts people both from you know whether it's them, their family, their you know, people they work with, you know, that, that kind of thing and how it really is everywhere. What, what are you seeing? Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of the data that you see nationally um, that's been identified is one out of every three families in this country have had some direct connection to a substance use disorder. So, you know, that's a lot of people. <laughs> um, you know, I think what you tend to see is, um, you know, the media tends to portray the opioid use, the opioid epidemic, where they'll identify it only as the people who are living in tents or under bridges. And that's just not the reality, you know? And, and likewise, we know that alcohol kills far more people than heroin ever has. Um, and that will always be the case. Alcohol is still the most, you know, the most deadly drug that we have when it comes to substance use disorder. And, and that often doesn't get featured because you know, well, we live in a state where liquor stores fund so much of our budget that the chances of like, hey, let's put a big focus on alcohol use disorder is just is not happening. Um, so and that's and that's where we're seeing, you know, with COVID, that's probably the area that you're seeing the biggest increases. Like, you know, people are hearing like, oh, the liquor stores are setting all time records for sales. Like that's not necessarily a great thing. It might help with some of our revenue, but the damage that that's doing with people who are isolated and now drinking far more than they ever did at home. And how many, you know, the good news is only about 10% of people are end up with a substance use disorder um, out of all the people who will use alcohol. So most, for most people, it won't become a substance use disorder, but it's still, it's still a significant number. Um, and it's not just drugs, it's, it's all part. And, and the impact on a family can be devastating. I know for me, like the, you know, when I, as a person in recovery, I was never really involved with the recovery community, but I, when my daughter started struggling with heroin, I, I distinctly remember so many friends that just kind of stepped away like, hmm, oh yeah, we're, uh, I hope, hope everything's okay, and then didn't hear from them anymore. Um, whereas I found with, a re, with the recovery community, they really embraced providing supports and help for that. Um, but it was, you know, it was troubling to have so many, you know, too often I would be questioned as a parent, like, well, maybe you weren't strict enough, or maybe you were too strict. And it's like, you know, I know now that obviously none of that probably had any impact on it. And, you know, typically there's stuff related to trauma and all kinds of other stuff that impacts individuals that causes substance use disorder. But, um, you know, it's, it's, there's really no rhyme or reason to it. And it's, and it's around us a lot more prevalently. Likewise, the other side of this is what people often don't identify is there's still 23 million people in this country that are, are in recovery. And a lot of people in recovery because of the stigma over the years don't want to talk about it and they're not out there, from, you know, so oftentimes it's amazing how often since I've done this work, people that I would have never known are like, yeah, I've been in recovery for like 10 years, but I've never talked about it until we started seeing you doing public, and that's a big part of our mission is to do the advocacy and do very public facing events to say like, hey, people do recover and they're all around you. You just don't realize it. That's that's a really important point. I've met a few people that work in your organization and they're just fantastic. They're open, they're transparent, they're friendly, they're down to earth. These, these The men and women that work with you have just been really impressive. So question for you, a big push of yours oh, oh, not so far back was the Recovery Friendly Workplace Initiative through the governor's office. I've heard mixed things. Is that still an initiative? Does that still exist? Yes. So it's still an initiative. Um, Granite United Way still has Recovery Friendly Advisors. They've actually added a Recovery Friendly. So there's good news and bad news there. The Recovery Friendly Advisors are still around and supporting businesses, and it's still a critical mission. Um, there was a big so there was two separate funding sources for that. One of them focused on the local recovery community organizations such as SOS to be kind of supportive of the statewide initiative. The funding for the local stuff, so for us, was only one year. 
And so that stopped, that ended. And so now there's a push to like, how do we get that going? Because, you know, the, the, the recovery friendly advisors with Grant United Way have identified like that partnership was so critical and so important. And we've still got a lot of stuff just because of how we do the work. So we, prov we do, you know, for instance, like Chameleon Group in Dover, they were a big um, on board with this. And they had a lot of individuals in recovery working for them that would like, you know, that would, they'd let them go to meetings during the day to support their recovery. But what he was finding is they'd do it on their lunch break and the meetings last an hour and lunch breaks an hour. So how do you get there and back in time? So we started sending our staff to the chameleon group and we would just hold the meetings in, in the place of employment and they could eat lunch and attend the meeting at the same time. So we're still doing some of those things to support some of the employers that were brought on and we're just in the process of identifying some additional funding sources. And I think, I think we're gonna see funding coming out from the state. Um, but if you happen to run into the governor, feel free to give him a nudge and tell him you wanna see more of it. Cause that's one of those realities. When you look at stigma, we know there's people struggling with alcohol and drugs in all of our workplaces, big or small. Um, and, you know, an employer, and that's like, let's, let's provide those supports now and let's provide supports to family members because oftentimes if you've got a family member in crisis, that can be draining and consuming and having the ability to be able to talk about it at your place of employment can be really important um, to know that it's a safe place that they can find those supports. So I think that's, you know, let's get to people and provide supports before they lose their job and their housing and, you know, and help people before it becomes even more problematic because that tends to be the cycle with so many, so. This is um, amazing, the services that you guys offer to our community out there. And I love the fact that it's in a, many different locations so that people have easier access, including online. Um, what are some of the best ways for people to get a hold of you um, if they have questions? Um, I assume you, uh, as a nonprofit, are always looking for donations, um, funding sources. Yeah. So, I mean, donations are always welcomed. Um, so the, the ways that, so we really try to reduce barriers to contact us. One of the things we started was a recovery support service line. And so that's available 9am to 6pm, seven days a week. And we have people monitoring that and you can both call it or text it. So whether you're an individual, a family member, part of it, part of the goal of that is even to support employers. So say your employer trying to be recovery friendly, and you have questions like, I don't know what to do. It's a line that you could call that and we will connect with resources. So the number for that is 603-932-5411. So again, that's available seven days a week. Um, and then if you go to our website, there's sosrco.org and down on the bottom right corner of every single page on it, there's a little button that you can chat with us. And it's not like one of those just automated chats. Um, any of the hours that our centers are open, people can dive in there and one of our staff jumps in within about 30 seconds and we can hold a protected conversation. So that's been something we identified because so many people that are in early recovery or struggling, they, are, they may have social anxiety and not be comfortable picking up the phone and calling us, but they're more than comfortable clicking on that and having a chat like that. So it can be less daunting for people to make that first step. And we've had a lot of success with that. Um, and then they can always call our centers too. So the recovery support service line through our website. Um, and there's also a donate button on our website on just about every page too. So that's, that's the other alternative. Um, <laughs> we accept, we accept people, we, we encourage people to click on both buttons. Um, <laughs> but we try to make it easy to reach us. Um, you know, hopefully our hours are a little bit reduced right now. So we're open nine to five in our Dover center at four Broadway. We're open 10 to six Monday through Friday in Rochester and Hampton. Rochester, it's at 14 Signal Street in the Dynasty Plaza. And then in Hampton, we're on one Lafayette Road, which is right on the Hampton Falls line out by the marsh. And it's building one at one Lafayette Road in Hampton. So they can walk in there. Those are both open 10 to six. Um, eventually, we used to have Dover open 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Saturday, plus 10, 12 to four on Sundays. And Hampton was open three nights a week till eight. 
So I'm hoping we're kind of shooting for like September, October to go back to those hours. One of the challenges we've had is we did all this digital stuff. So now I've got people scheduled to do digital stuff and trying to reopen the centers back to full blown is hard when you've got people doing chat meetings at like 7 a.m. and 11 p.m. and trying to do all that with the same funding is, is tricky. So, but we're getting there. Wow, that's fantastic. I'm so, I'm so impressed and so grateful for all you're doing for our community. Um, and, and for the people, you know, there's, it could, it could, it can and does happen to all of us at some point where we're con somehow connected with this. So thank you for, for those efforts, and um, and hopefully we can help build a little more awareness for you. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you, and that's been a key of our success is really the community has been so supportive in all three of the areas that we're in and just across the state. There's been a lot of support, and and that really makes a big difference in, in the success of the programs because they're really built around what the community needs rather than what we want to provide. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.